All right. Well, good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, good number on a holiday uh, weekend. Had good number this morning. I thank you for that. Uh, we will uh, start. Uh, we started a new this morning with a new and a fresh book of the Bible. Tonight we'll start a new second part of Daniel different from the first part but like it in some ways but this part deals more with revelation and what's to come than the first part did but we'll be trying to get that together it take us a while to get to where I want to get but we'll get there sooner or later and of course we're getting a new Sunday school last morning we'll get a new lesson with the Baptist men this morning so it's a new day everything new and that's the way I like it. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear God, for this day. That God, that we can come back into your house. And that God, as the Bible says, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And God, I, I believe that that's the way we need to enter into this place. And leave this place in a little bit. In spirit and in truth. And God, I pray that the Holy Spirit may lead us tonight, guide us tonight, and God, that we might feel His presence in this place tonight. And that God, that you would uh, touch us as we preach, touch those that sing, that God, that we might have a true spirit of worship here. God, we just want to say thank you for all the things that you did in our church last year, which were more numerous than I could even account. And Lord, I want to thank you for blessing us the way you did. And God, as we look forward to this new church year beginning today, God, I pray and believe this, that the blessings are going to be greater. I believe that you're going to show us things, God, that we may never have seen. And God, that we will be drawn closer to you than we've ever been. And that is my desire and hope in all the things that I do here. God bless us now. May you be honored now. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for those that are watching tonight. We appreciate you being with us tonight. Tonight for our missionary moment, as I told you this morning, we're beginning today. It's a new day with all of the, everything going on in the church. is kind of new today. We're back uh, at the month of our Janie Chapman State Mission Offering. 
and I talked to you about that this morning and how we need to support it and how we need to get that money very quickly because I love missions and I love foreign missions and I love all those things. But in my heart, missions begin at home. In my heart, they begin first here at Southside and then they move to the state convention. And then we move out. He said, go to Judea, Jerusalem, and, and then into all the world. So we need to look at home first. And I was reading and was given some stuff about two missionaries. And their names are Barry and Jennifer Smith. Barry is a bivocational pastor. That means, and I've been there and did that for 10 years, so I know about working and preaching because I did it for a long time. And so I can feel what he goes through. And much like me, as I read this, Miss Colleen, I said, that's a lot like me starting. And he had been out to Utah to start a church. And as he had went out there the first time, he failed. He could not get the church off the ground. Now, the thing that you must know about Utah, and I think most of us do, that Utah is the state known for the Mormon religion. The temples and the tabernacles and all the things that they consider part important in their religion is in Utah. It's a very, I remember some years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention was held in Salt Lake City, Utah. Probably the vast, vast, great majority of the people in Utah claim the Mormon religion. And so going in there and starting a Baptist church is a big task. At first time, it didn't work. But he never gave up, and God never took that desire out of his heart that that's what God wanted him to do. So we have a church that was in the upstate that decided that they were going to partner with this church and that we were going to take in our state money and help send him again out to start this new church in Utah. And I have got the information with the partnership that I just want to share a couple of things with you about it. This church is located in what is known as Eagle Mountain, Utah. It says he's by vocation. I've told you that, and this is his second attempt to plant a church. First one failed. But thank God he didn't give up, did he? I've uh, been teaching the Baptist men on their breakfast on, in the month on the subject of it's never too late. And I've used people in the Bible that people had given up on and never thought they would ever do it, but God used them in the midst of all these things. And so when he got there, what he found out was this. There was only one commercial building in that town that was available for him to start a ministry. One. And so he gave, the, the man that owned it gave him a pretty good deal, and he rented uh, and relaunched this church out there. And the thing that got me, he called it Pioneer Community Church. And this is what he said, and, I, and I'll close with this. He said, we have about 40 people who are part of a church. they got 40 members. And you may say, 40 members? That's why he's got to work. <laughs> they only got 40 members. But he also says this. He says, we have about 25 people on Sundays. We have that many. And then he says this. But since COVID, even that has gone down. And so he says that we have several critically ill people in our church, and nine of them are women. And we had one time... 21 hospital stays among our people. Now, if you ain't got but 25 coming, at some point in time, 21 of them ends up in the hospital, you got to realize there could be a lot of Sundays, you ain't got a lot of people there. 
And that could be discouraging there. But what he says is this. And what we learn is this. That there are people in the world that we support that we'll never know. This money that we'll take up this month for our state missions will not only reach people in South Carolina for Jesus, but even South Carolina money can go as far as Utah to reach people out there for Jesus. Jesus didn't say you got to have a church with 2,000 in it. He said 25 will do. And if one of them comes to know the Lord because of what we gave, then you know what the Bible says? That the angels will rejoice over that one. So it's never wasted, folks. And so that's why I encourage you not only to give tonight as we take up our mission offering, but also during the month of September to give generously to our Janie Chapman and let's far exceed. Three, listen, I have seen what this church can do when it comes to missions. We've never not exceeded a mission goal since I've been here and gone far above it. This will also go far above if we'll just give. And I want to tell you something else. God will bless you with this giving. Any money given to a mission work in the name of God, God takes note of it up in heaven. So you give generously as we do this. And before we take up our offering, i got... This was on my desk today that we have taken up uh, in the last, since we've been taken up, and this is just another mission project that that we've started here at Southside in the last year of buying Bibles and sending them out. And we've already taken up almost $1,500 to buy Bibles. And our church has bought $1,150 two Bibles that are gone out to somebody somewhere and if one person reads that Bible gets saved, the blessings come back on us and so I'm so thankful that we give God loveth a cheerful giver right? So we're going to take up our offering now uh I will pray Mimi will come and lead us in our theme song for Sunday nights as we're getting back into the prophecy of Daniel for today. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for men like this and wives like this that will forsake all and go out into a very hard place to minister. And God, tonight I pray for them because she's been sick They've had sickness. Their church has sickness. God, I pray for your healing hand to get upon uh, Brother Barry's family, his wife, God, for his church. And God, I pray that tonight as we pray, that as far out as Utah, that God, you will know, as Paul said to the Philippian church in our Sunday school lesson this morning, that I am always praying for you. May we always pray for those that are doing the mission work. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, Mimi, come lead us in our theme. And this is our theme song on Sunday nights. Soon and very soon. Stand with us, please.
Thank you so much. I'm glad to have back with us tonight very dear friends of mine for many years since I've been in Sumter. And we stay in close contact with each other and we know each other well. And uh, I don't know who told Miss Mary that they were sitting in a dangerous position said the preacher was almost go jump the pews this morning and y'all are in a bad place. So Brother Greg told me if I jumped the pews, he'd catch me, didn't he? That's right. All right. Brother Greg, y'all come on. I think that's left up to the Lord. Yeah, he <laughs> Oh, man. And I don't want him to. <laughs> what about him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Test him. <laughs> oh, I know. There's so many times that I think about this good brother. <coughs> he married one of my daughters. He converted both of them from my faith to Baptist. <laughs> both my daughters. And uh, <laughs> I love him to death. I really do. Amy called me the other night. I'm going to tell you, if you don't think being a godly spouse to your spouse can make a difference. When Amy married her husband, he was not a believer. He didn't even want to go to church. But you know what won him to Christ? He saw my daughter reading the scripture Amen. every day. And he would ask her questions and she would explain it to him. And he is now in the church, an active member of their church that they attend in Dallas, Texas. And I can tell you that their children are growing up reading the Bible Amen. and hearing mama read the Bible. And I think we as parents sometimes fail when we don't show a little more of God to our children and to our spouses. And it's so easy to do. And, uh, and I, I really, I didn't get up here to do all this talking, let me tell you that. Nonetheless, he just means a lot, and, and, uh, and I, I think a lot of him, so. Many times. Oh, I'm in the wrong key, I'm sorry. I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. I don't sing that high. <laughs> I did that one time at a very big church, and Wendy never forgave me, so therefore. <laughs> Many times I'm in the valley so low, I just look and see a lily that grows, oh Lord. This makes me feel so near to Thee. Then I look and see a mountain so high The tears began to fill my eyes, O oh Lord. This makes me feel so near to Thee. Near to Thee, yes, near to Thee, O Lord, I feel so to thee when I think about my new home a mansion I can call my own oh Lord 
of how you were crucified. You hung, you bled, and you died, O oh Lord. This makes me feel so near to thee. When I think about my mansion so near and that great meeting we'll have in the air, O oh Lord, this makes me feel so near to thee. Near to thee, yes, near to thee, O Lord. I feel so near to My new home, a mansion I can call my own, O oh Lord. I feel so near to Thee, O oh Lord. I feel so near to Thee. I was thinking, Brother Greg, when y'all was singing that about the mansion, something I never thought about. I preach about it a lot, but I never thought about it, uh, about having a mansion. And I believe it'll be a mansion that you won't have to pay no taxes on. You ain't got to buy no insurance on. There ain't no upkeep. There ain't going to be no money. You got to come by to drain your sewer line. It's going to be all right. Right? We're going to leave everything in this old world behind one day and look at a place that we never dreamed of or thought of of what it was going to be and what a day that's going to be when we get there. Tonight, as I told you and have been telling you, I'm going to start teaching a series that's going to be entitled God's Incredible Plan for the Nation. God's incredible plans for the nation. Now, when we left off, it's been a few nights, a few, a long time since we've really been in the book of Daniel because of other things that were happening. But when we left Daniel the last time, where was he? In a lion's den. When we left him the last time, that God had come down and God had rescued him from that den of lies. But when we read about Daniel in the seventh chapter and he leaves that lion's den, you may think that Daniel might have come out, remember where he's at, he's in Babylon, and that he might have went back, remember Daniel is 80-something years old now, that he might have went back but when he got out of the lion's den, that did not happen. When he come out of the lion's den, Daniel began to have visions himself. Now I want to remind you, how many of you, and I hate these, ever watch TV shows, and you'll be watching the TV show, and they'll flash back to something that happened in the past, about somebody to bring you up. I can't stand that. My wife, I despise that. Well, back in 1973, this is guy's 50 years old now, but he was 13 years old then, and it goes back and it keeps going. I just, I just soon cut it off and not watch that. I'm not a going back kind of guy. And so, but this is really what happens with Daniel here. God 
is giving him. Now remember before, as we did the first half of Daniel, now we're on the second half. Visions and dreams in the first half will be visions and dreams in the second half. Will be one in the ninth chapter of Daniel may be the most prophetic few verses that there are in the Old Testament where Daniel names the number of days and times at the end. I've already preached years ago to you about that. But this is very important because remember the dreams that Daniel dealt with in the first three chapters. They remember how there was a king named Belshazzar. And he had a dream and he couldn't sleep and his wise men couldn't answer it. And finally, Daniel, who can interpret dreams, he came to Belshazzar and he interpreted his dream for him. And the dream that Belshazzar had was this. Remember, this is going to be a difference between now and then. Then, Belshazzar had the dream, and if you remember, he saw a statue, didn't he? had a head of gold, silver, iron, brass, clay that represented the four kingdoms back then that were to come. So that's a, listen, God did exactly what he prophesied in those dreams because there came a Babylonian kingdom, there came a Medo-Persian kingdom, there came a Greek kingdom with Alexander the Great, and then there came the worst kingdom of all that was the last kingdom, which was the kingdom of Rome, who was cruel and murdered and cut people's head off, and they dominated the known world of that day. And that's the last kingdom. Now Daniel prophesied in those dreams that they would happen, and what has happened? They all came about. They're past history to us. Now remember, we, we, excuse me, we go back to the past. Because now, Daniel, who interpreted Belshazzar's dreams, now has visions from God himself. Now in Belshazzar's dreams, he saw... Four king, I mean, yeah, four kingdoms and empires that would come and would be destroyed. As we go along in the book of Daniel, God gives Daniel a vision. Not of what he did in the vision, because that's done, done. But when we come to this part of Daniel, this part of Daniel will tie in to Revelation. Daniel, in his vision, and I'm just giving you a synopsis, and we're going to dive into it, probably not tonight, but this is just the lead-in. In Daniel's vision, well, in Belshazzar's vision, he saw four kingdoms. Daniel's vision, he sees four beasts. Those beasts represent to Daniel, that God was telling him, now that the empires are gone, that these four beasts represent what the world will face in the days to come. That's us. He saw four beasts. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the beast, or the beast, one that comes up out of the sea. And so this is where Daniel begins to tie in with Revelation. Now remember, I've always been told this in all of my ministry by preachers that are, are much more knowledgeable than I. And this is what I've learned, is I've, I've taught Daniel before, but I've never delved into it this deep. But they said you'll never understand Revelation until you understand Daniel. Because a lot of what Daniel prophesied also is seen in the book of Revelation. The beast coming out of the sea. Daniel saw four beasts. The Bible says in the very beginning of Revelation as we get into the tribulation period, which is to come for me and you yet, he said, I saw four men on four different horses. So we're beginning 
not to look at, we'll refer back to the past, but we're more or less beginning to look more to the future as God revealed it to Daniel. And I want you to understand that even though we will look back at some things. Now what we will learn is this, that God gives Daniel a bit. Now remember who Daniel was. He was high up in the government. In 80 some odd years in his life, he had seen several kingdoms come and go. But then when God gives him this vision, he could interpret Belshazzar's vision. He could interpret the handwriting on the wall when nobody else could. But what Daniel could not do was interpret the visions of the future that God was giving to him in a dream. He could not interpret his own dream. He could interpret somebody else's, but he could not interpret his own. So God saying this, Daniel, and I'm just giving you an overview tonight. I'll be going in depth in this. God says to Daniel, this is so important because this is the future. This is what's coming. If you can't understand it, then I'll send an angel to come and interpret it for you. Because he said, Daniel, this is what you need to do. You need to write this down. That's what Daniel did. He said, Daniel, write down what I'm showing you now. Let it be until the time that it is needed be sure that you have this. Now there's a, a um, author that I have several of his books in my library. And his name is Dr. John Wolford. He is or was the president of Dallas Seminary. He was a prophetic scholar. He could take the word of God. I've got several of his prophetic books that he wrote even when I did not have an understand. But this is what Dr. John Wolvert said about the book of Daniel. This is his quote. He says, The vision of Daniel that God gives him now provides the most comprehensive and detailed prophecy of what's going to happen in the future than can be found anywhere else in the Old Testament. A very educated, a man that understood prophecy. His book on Daniel, I don't have it, but he wrote one. He said that there's no other book in the Old Testament. Now, we have a lot of prophets. We have a lot of preachers. We have a lot of those things in the Old Testament, don't we? You got Jeremiah. You got Ezekiel. One of the great, two of the great prophecy chapters in the Bible is Ezekiel 37 38. One day, prophesy rush is coming. When they prophesy the attack from the kings of the north into the nation of Israel, God's already told us that's going to be the first step of the tribulation there is when the armies of the north come down. Dr. Wolver said that's not the greatest. He said the greatest prophecy in the Old Testament is what God is about to do in the life of Daniel. Daniel goes to sleep. And during that sleep, God sends a vision to him of what's to come. And he nails it down very specifically. In the, I was reading, and I'll promise you, as old as I am, I have never read more Bible or studied more Scripture or studied more things about the Bible than I have in the years that I've been your pastor. God has given me a refreshing and an awakening since I've been at Southside. And I have read more and studied more and tried to learn more until sometimes I feel like my head's going to explode. I thank God you don't mean for a dummy like me to know all this stuff. 
And he said, but yes, I do, because unless you know it, how are you going to tell them? So, every day almost of my life, I delve in this stuff. I'm hooked. I'm telling you, hook, line, and sinker, God has caught me. And I'm excited about it. I'm telling you, I'm excited about the new journey. I told you, this is a new journey, didn't I? I'm telling you, it's a, it's a new journey for me. My wife thinks I'm nuts sometimes. She does. Well, she started a long time. She just got a little more bolder with it now. Because she thinks as I'm getting older, I'm getting senile. And I can't remember. That's why I write this stuff down in case I don't. But Jesus, I mean, Daniel here is about to communicate the future of the Jewish nation. There's really one nation in this world that God really cares about. They're his chosen people. He didn't say we were his chosen people. He said they were. And I've heard preachers say all of my life that God's eye is not on Washington. It's not in Paris. It's not in London. That the eyes of God are in Jerusalem. And that's where everything is about to happen at. And it is getting more of a process of, listen, all the Middle East people that hate Jerusalem, are now even more than any time in history about to pack together. And this leads to the end. And we see it in the news, and we see it everywhere now. Now, Dr. Jerry Byers, I know Brother Lynn knows him, he used to be the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, for many, many years. One of the most brilliant men that I've ever read and studied was Dr. Jerry Vine. They named him right when they put doctor before his name. I don't say that about most. But they got it right when they did this. And Dr. Jerry Vines wrote in his studies of Daniel, because I read him. I do. This is what he said. Now, Dr. Woolward said what about Daniel? That it is the greatest prophetic teaching in the Old Testament. Well, Dr. Jerry Vines even goes further than Dr. Woolward did. He said this, that the seventh chapter, now we'll be getting into all this sometime this year or next year. I don't know. If I wander around like I do most time, it'll be two years. I don't know. Seventh chapter is a long way away, ain't it? But Dr. Jerry Vines says this. He says that the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel is the greatest chapter of prophecy in the whole Old Testament. That one chapter will tell you more about what's coming, what we're looking at, what we're going to face, than any other. I didn't say that. Men smarter than I have said those things but I read them, and I trust him. I don't read who I don't trust. A lot of that garbage out there I would not put in my shed out there, much less in my house. But Dr. Vines and Dr. Ward, they're just some of those that I respect. And what he says in this seventh chapter, the greatest chapter in the Bible, he said, this is what you find. And I hadn't gone to the seventh chapter. I didn't even looked at it yet. I don't even remember what it says, but I'll get there. I can't get too far ahead of myself or I won't know where I'm at. So I just take it week by week and verse by verse. But Dr. Jerry Vine said, this is a chapter in the Bible that is about nothing but pure prophecy and things that are to come. Now we'll get there one day, I hope. Or maybe the trumpet sound, and we won't, and we'll be okay. We'll be better. But that's what he says. He says this is the record of God's unchanging plan for the nations of the world. 
that the seventh chapter of Daniel tells of God's unchanging plans for the world to come. And we'll see. I'll study it and, and, and see what these great men say about it and try to put it in my mind. And this is what Dr. Vine said. He says that the think tanks of the nations will project their warnings. Now, the Bible gives us warnings about the end, doesn't it? The Bible says to look at the signs around about you and know that your redemption is drawing near. There's not a Christian that reads their Bible or comes to church or has a preacher that's worth 50 cents that they don't be able to look at what's going on in the world and say, this is what's happening now. Amen. It is. It is. And so he says that in this chapter, the think tanks, you know one of the big problems with the world today? We've got too many smart people. The think tanks, those that look out there and say, well, I can tell you what's wrong with the world today. The main problem, the whole thing that's wrong with the world today is climate change. <laughs> right? It don't matter if they're fighting in Afghanistan it don't matter if 90, 100,000 are coming across the border. The greatest problem we got, according to the think tank, is global warming. Makes me want to throw up. I'm glad I'm not one of them. I'm glad God didn't give me a lot of brains, but he gave me some common sense. Amen. The thing that is lacking in this nation today is we got too much brains and not enough common sense. I gotta quit. He says that, that I'm, I'm gonna quote him now. <laughs> I, mean, I get wound up in. But this is what he says. He says the think tanks of these nations project warnings about number one, the holes in the ozone. Ain't nobody never knew about no ozone 40 years ago. And then he says. They will, and listen, if you don't think he's nailing us to where we are today, he said the thinks tanks of the day, the smart people, the scientists that they tell you to trust in, he said they will teach you of global warming. They will teach you that we have misused and are depleting the natural resources of the earth. Folks, this is God's world. We can do no more harm to this world than God allows us to. I don't care what they tell you. I don't care what they say. The reason they're fires is this is God's world, and he said don't fire, not climate change. And not only that, when you know the Bible, that not only will they burn out west, but one day the whole world will burn. And do you not think that God might be trying to tell us something here? But see, we missed the point because we're too smart. It's the ozone layer. Not God. We're going to deplete the natural resources so we've got to go to solar energy. We'll never deplete the resources of this earth until God says so. God made it. He made enough. And it'll be there until he says it's not there. And he says they will not only talk about the depletion of natural resources, but they will also talk of all the nuclear capabilities that there are in the world. Now that Afghanistan is gone, now that the whole Middle East is full of terror, that's where we are. Y'all can laugh at me and say, you're crazy, but that's where we are. We've come home. We've given it to them. That may not bother you. And I say, that's stupid. And now who are the people that are most dangerous that holds the key to the button of the nuclear weapons that are in this world? Crazy people. 
Pakistan got a big nuclearocracy, and they hate us. China, who knows what they got? They hate us. Russia, who knows what they got? They hate us. I want to ask, is there anybody out there that loves us anymore? We're even turning our allies against us now. Do you not see a picture here? Do you not see a picture of the end coming here? Do you not see why we're not mentioned in the end times? China is, Russia is, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, all of those countries, they're all mentioned in the Bible. But you can't find us there. Do you not see that we're drifting away from God and we're turning over the nation of God to the ungodly people and the ungodly here, and now we're giving it away. This is prophesied in Daniel. That's why it is so good, and I'll get to it. But man today, and this is Dr. Byron's again, he said, is unable to give us a clue about the ultimate future of mankind. As smart as they are, and they may have their theories, but the only place where you can find the future is in the Bible. Now, people write other things, smart people, But in the Bible, it tells us of the future of mankind. And it's not that hard. Daniel, and I got to close, and I got to quit. Now, I, I, I was hoping, but I know it's going to take a long time, but I can't help it. That's just me. Daniel, does anyone does not believe that the Bible is a supernatural book. That's where we got to get to, folks. So many people do not believe the Bible because it goes out into places they never dreamed of. It deals from a God they don't know. And remember what I told you this morning. Man is bound by time and space. That's the natural. That's where the world is today. They're in the box. But the world is a supernatural. Heaven is a supernatural place. God is a supernatural God, and the world can't find him because they won't get out of the worldliness and the world they live in and will not go out in the out of the box and realize that there is a supernatural God that created the heavens and the earth. There is a supernatural God that sent Jesus Christ to this earth. There is a super God that raised him from the dead, and there is a supernatural God that is going to send him back again. They don't want to believe that. They, the Bible says that in... I said I was going to quit, didn't I? The Bible says that in the last days that people will be scoffers. They'll look at somebody like me that believes Jesus is coming again. They'll look at somebody like me that believes that all truth that a man needs to know is found in this book right here. That the answer to every problem that a man has is found written in here. The answer to your past is written in here. The answer to your present is written in here. The promise of your future is written here. God's got it, folks. That's why I have quit worrying about it. I promise you, I worry none about it. God has given me a peace. And you know what got me? I told you that this morning. What got me that was Bible school. I want to tell you something about Bible school. Bible school may have affected nobody in this church or nobody that came. But the one person that Bible school affected the most was me. I began to see things in a different light. God began to show me things that I'd never seen. 
And God began to take me outside the box and put me in the supernatural realm. And it all started with Bible school. You'll say, preacher, that don't make, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. And you know what? I'm happy being outside the box. I'm glad I'm not in the box anymore. I believe in a supernatural God. I believe that my God can do anything. And Daniel believes in a supernatural God. And Daniel believes that there is a supernatural God that has seen the kingdoms of this earth before they ever existed. Saw America before America was ever America. Saw all these nations before they ever existed. They could never have become what they are without him. But he, I'm dealing with the seventh chapter of Daniel. Like I said, I ain't even read it today yet. But he says there's more truth in this chapter and in this book than man could probably ever understand. I am so looking forward to leaving here and moving on. That's the introduction. And we're going to see What's coming next? Next Sunday night is Daniel has the dream and the angel comes to interpret it for him. And we'll start that next Sunday night. Thank you for being here tonight. Now, uh, tonight, um, Brother Daniel, you can take us off. Thank you all for being with us tonight.